Thank you very much for being here. We're so excited about this panel. And this panel, as you can tell, is about race, gender, and sexuality in sports media. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Christina Carl, who is the co-founder of Baseball Prospectus, a major league baseball writer and an editor for ESPN.com. We also have on this panel Jesse Garcia of Milwaukee's WTMJ. And as many of you know, she's covered the Green Bay Packers for many years. And then we have Scott Buckstein, who is from the University of Central Florida, and he specializes in sports business management, especially focusing on questions of diversity. And we've kind of envisioned this panel as something a little more organic. We'd like to have a discussion amongst ourselves, but also with all of you. And so what I'm going to do is have our panelists begin by going into a little bit more detail about themselves, taking some time to talk, and also answering this first initial question, which is, why is it that you've agreed to sit on a panel specifically about race, gender, and sexuality as it pertains to ethics? So let's get that started, and then we'll get a, a discussion going with the rest of the group here. I'll start with you. OK, well then, um, golly, I'm on deck. Our, uh, ah, about ethics, I mean, I would say you know, like I'm in an um, unusual position in the sense that um, when I came out as a trans woman in 2002, 2003, you know, there wasn't a lot of history of trans people in the workplace and certainly not a lot of history of trans people in journalism. I mean, you go back to, you know, like in a sense, you know, you might say Jan Morris was the first trans sports journalist because um, before she transitioned, she covered like the conquest of Mount Everest, but, you know, she didn't come out until 10 years later. But, you know, so, but to come out and particularly in the online environment, and particularly in one of the major you know, four major sports and covering one of the four major sports would come out. It hadn't been done in this country. People didn't really know how it was going to work out. And, you know, so right there, my career was a test case of how were people in sports, both within Major League Baseball, but also just, you know, other people on the beat going to be able to respond. And were readers going to freak out and like bail on what was at the time a subscription website? Um, I'm here, so obviously it turned out pretty well. But, you know, there's also, you know, like I'm just on the front edge of a wave of, you know, growing awareness about trans people in sports, and particularly competing as athletes. And so, you know, I'm in this odd situation because it's such a small community of people, but I know an awful lot of the people who are prominent trans athletes in this country. I work with them. I'm friends with them. I, you know, like end up like doing a lot of advocacy and activism with them about like trans inclusion in sports. But, um, you know, they're sitting up from where I am as a journalist. I'm also in the situation of trying to explain stories about trans athletes and how to cover trans athletes to my colleagues, like in the press. And so, you know, I'm usually as, used as a sounding board, like, okay, I've got a trans kid who's coming out and, as an athlete in high school and, you know, is fighting this battle for inclusion. And how do I write this story? Where do I even start? I've never had to do something. I'm a sports reporter. So, you know, like a lot of peer-to-peer -peer relationships about explaining like how to talk about trans people to a mainstream audience, how to talk about trans inclusion in sports as an issue. Um, I'm really just kind of encouraging people that, you know, like one, don't get weirded out. It's, you know, like kid just wants to play. I just want to work. And as a question of, you know, like what issues are involved with that, um, it really is, is an opportunity to engage people in a conversation which, you know, is going to be worked out both on a policy level and a societal level, like, over the next decade. And so, you know, like, it's understandable. I mean, journalists are supposed to know about everything in their subject field. Well, stuff about LGBT people in particular probably wasn't covered in most of, if you had to take a journalism ethics course, LGBT topics probably weren't included. And certainly trans topics in particular really probably weren't even on the radar until like, you know, within the last five years. So a lack of familiarity and fundamentally an ignorance on trans topics among journalists of any stripe, but also in sports, totally understandable, totally forgivable until you put it on the page, in which case then you have a responsibility to know what you're writing about and understand both both the policy landscape, the challenges for the athletes themselves, the challenges as far as like, you know, combating I think a lot of misunderstandings about trans athletes and about like what's what's involved. You know, that's where you gotta start somewhere. Everybody has to learn about the subject on some level because it's going to be a subject until it isn't. 
there's going to be a changing dynamic in conversation about these kinds of issues, in part because of the way society has responded to trans people who have come out already. So, you know, like that's again something I'd say is it's a dynamic field. It's an opportunity to kind of like, you know, explore and understand people who are very different from yourself. But it's also something that, you know, because of sports gives us an opportunity to talk about like, what do we have in common? Well, we all kind of enjoy sports, or we all have a facility, particularly in American society, with some level of talking about sports. And I would say that, you know, like sports is the great icebreaker, the great social lubricant. It is the thing that allows us to basically connect with somebody else on something outside ourselves. And so as a topic, and also as something that we enjoy ourselves as athletes, yeah, we really can't beat it. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jesse Garcia, and a little bit about myself. First of all, I wanted to tell you, UW-Madison is very close to my heart. I was born at the old University Hospital on University Avenue, and for those of you who remember when Sterling Hall was bombed here on campus as part of the anti-war protest, I was born five days after that, and my mother could see the bombed-out shell of the building of Sterling Hall from her hospital bed. So I was born into a, a very interesting time in history, I was also born into the height of feminism. Um, I was raised on the liberal east side of Madison, went to Madison East High School. And uh, my mother, when I was growing up, was a carpenter and an architectural designer. Later, she went um, and taught English as a second language. She had an interesting uh, career arc. But when I was growing up, when your mother is walking around with a hammer and wearing overalls, um, you never think that there's nothing that a, a woman can't do. You just. Uh, you, it's in your mind that a woman can do and be anything. And so I think that that you know, shaped me as I, as I grew up. And I, there was never once a thought that I couldn't become a sportscaster if I wanted to or anything else that I wanted to be. Um, other uh, connections, <laughs> being here in Union South is kind of funny because I went to preschool just a block or two away from here. And um, we came over and used to go bowling in the basement of Union South. I'm not sure if they still have a bowling alley here, but when they did, uh, and I, I believe the story is that I bowled my first strike uh, at the age of five, you know, completely by accident, uh, you know, pushing it down, and it rolls about, you know, <laughs> slowly, and the whole place went nuts. Um, at least that's the story. I don't remember it. But um, so it's nice to be back uh, on the UW-Madison campus. I used to take college for kids classes at Baskin Hill. Uh, I, I am not a graduate of UW-Madison. I went to Boston University, um, Terriers, hockey team right now. Uh, but, you know, even though I'm not a Badger, I, I always feel like a part of me is. And I think we're all especially proud of the Badgers this past week and how they performed um, in the national title game. So that was exciting. I became Wisconsin's first female sports anchor um, in 1992. That's when I graduated from college. And, and the state of Wisconsin had never had a female sports anchor prior to that. There had been a couple of female sports reporters, but they never let them sit at the anchor desk. They thought that um, the state wasn't ready for a woman reading sports to them on a nightly basis. Um, so a couple stories about me getting hired. Uh, my first job was here in Madison at WISC, which is Channel 3, the CBS affiliate. And they weren't sure, like everybody else, if Madison was ready for a female sports anchor. So I found out later that the, the general manager overruled some people who did not want me to be hired and said, let's give her a shot. And I was hired part time, um, which eventually turned into full time, and then I went to WTMJ in Milwaukee where the same thing happened. They were not sure if uh, Milwaukee was ready for its first female um, sports anchor in 1994. So I have uh, you know, stories that we could get into later about some of those issues being one of the first women um, in the state and really in the country on the local level. When I was um, coming out of college, there were some um, role models for me on the national level. I mean, we had Robin Roberts, you know, who is wonderful, and, and Leslie Visser, and Hannah Storm, and you know, some of these, these great pioneering women. Uh, but on the local level, there were really no role models, and so I sort of had to cut my own um, path as I, as I went on. Were there obstacles? Absolutely. Um, one night, a man called Channel 3, and he said, I am never going to watch your station again. And I said, why? And he said, because you're a chick, and chicks don't know anything about sports. So, I mean, you can imagine what I wanted to say to this guy. But uh, what I said to him is, I hope you change your mind one day. And I don't know if he ever did. I never heard back from him. Um, but those were some of the early obstacles. Um, 
very early in my career, the Packers were playing um, at Camp Randall, and the, one of the players, who shall go unnamed, said to me, I won't do an interview with you unless you give me your phone number. Um, and so, you know, there are those types of landmines that um, female reporters may have to step into that male reporters may not. So we can talk more about that as well. Um, back then, it was still a novelty to have a woman in the locker room. And uh, if anybody's interested, I can tell you my worst ever locker room experience a little bit later in this discussion as well. But being a, a female, being half Mexican and half Jewish, uh, sportscaster has allowed me to see the world in a very, um, you know, different and interesting way. And I have some opinions on how to sort of stay above the ethical fray, so to speak. Um, and, and, and one of those that I'll just throw out there right now is just, uh, this has sort of been a topic within the last few weeks, too, uh, kind of brought up again because of some comments that a Chicago radio host made about a Chicago sportscaster. But, you know, it's kind of uh, how, how we as female sportscasters dress or present ourselves or conduct ourselves or act in a locker room situation. And we can talk a lot more about that, but I will just say right off the bat that, you know, I have always just been a huge advocate of, you want to be remembered for your words and your insights and your commentary. Don't even put yourself in the position where anybody could judge you based on what you're wearing or anything of that nature. So I am so aware of that uh, and, and always have been in everything that I do. And, and we can talk more about that. We just, we need to do what's right for ourselves, our careers, and, and for the profession as a whole. Um, I was one of the first women in the country to host an NFL coaches show when I hosted the Mike Holmgren show in 1998. Um, I also hosted the Mike McCarthy show for years. And I was the Packers sideline reporter um, for seven or eight years um, and, and traveled with them even to Tokyo, Japan when they played um, in Tokyo and also to the White House after they um, won the Super Bowl, won Super Bowl 31. Um, and I wrote a memoir called My Life with the Green and Gold, Tales from 20 Years of Sports Casting. Um, and I'm currently writing two other nonfiction sports related books. Um, and I teach journalism at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee after teaching at two other smaller um, schools in the Milwaukee area. So um, thrilled to be here, uh, happy to participate. and. Um, and wanted to participate because I think maybe I can give the perspective of the female sportscaster, and again, as one of the early pioneering female sportscasters. Good morning. Similar to Jesse, I have strong ties here to Madison. I grew up on the west side of Madison. <laughs> I went to high school right up the street at Madison West. Now, some of you, possibly many of you, are thinking, I look like I still attend Madison West High School. <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, I'm excited to be here. At one point in my career, I thought I was going to be a college basketball coach. So from 2002 to 2004, during the summer, Coach Paul Ryan and Coach Greg Gard, they gave me an opportunity to coach during their summer basketball camp. So it was exciting and rewarding to see right, the team excel these past few weeks and to see the impact that the team success has had on over morale here within the Madison community. I currently work as one of the directors within the DeVos Sport Business Management Program at the University of Central Florida, privileged to be in that role. And our program really focuses on four core values. These four core values, they impact everything we do with respect to curriculum or teaching in the class, the scholarly research we do, the practical we do, uh, work we do with partners within the sport business industry. And those four key values or pillars are diversity, community, leadership, and ethics. So I thought it might be helpful for us to establish possibly four right, core goals, objectives with respect to sports coverage of race, gender, and sexuality. I think if we focus on maybe a continuum, diversity, inclusion, respect, and equality as being the core goals. And then we want to ask ourselves, well, how can we get there? And I'll share some data with you in a little bit based on the research we do at the University of Central Florida. But I think it's important to focus on who are the key stakeholders? Who are the key decision makers within the sport business industry? My colleague, Kenneth Shropshire, he just wrote an excellent book that was published a few months ago, Sport Matters Leadership, Power, and the Quest for Respect in Sports. And within the book, Professor Shropshire, he identifies what he calls and he terms the sports power matrix. He looks at who are some of the key decision makers, the influencers within the sport business industry, and he identifies primarily eight different groups. You have fans, consumers, government, vendors, sponsors. And that might be half of the pie if we can picture a pie chart. So media 
will play a role within there as well. You have fans, government, sponsors, vendors, and media. And Professor Shropshire, he explains, well, the vast majority of the power with respect for the sport business industry lies in the hands of team owners, management, executives within these teams or sport organizations, and then the athletes. And so then I think it's important for us to focus on, well, who are those people making the decision? Because all too often it's people who look like me. Okay. Usually a little older than me, if not much older than me, but they're white males. And so what we do at the University of Central Florida through our Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sport, we look at racial and gender hiring practices right, at many of the major professional sport leagues. We also do a report every two years looking at who is involved in sport media. This is the Associated Press Sports Editor's Report. And the report for 2014 should get published within the next few weeks. So what I want to do is quickly share some of the data points for the study that was completed in 2013, right, based on data that we received from over 150 newspapers and websites in 2012. 90.9% .9 of all sports editors, white men. 86.6% of assistant sport editors were white individuals. 83.9% of all columnists, white individuals. 86.3% of reporters, white individuals. And approximately 86% of all copy editors, designers, white individuals. And now if we looked at the numbers and we're looking at gender, the numbers comparable. And they'll range from 80.4% of sport editors, designers, as men, all the way to just over 90% of all the sports editors being men. ESPN, definitely the industry leader with respect to hiring people of color, women, people from diverse orientations with respect to their sexuality. If we took ESPN out of the data set, the numbers, they'd be even more perplexing, troubling, and alarming. Why is it important to look at diversity with respect to who's in these positions? Because oftentimes, those are the folks who are writing the stories. Quote from Kenneth Shropshire from his book that I wanted to share. He says, without diversity at the highest leadership levels in sports, in terms of race, gender, outlook, and other factors, decisions that reflect and support true respect and inclusion will be difficult, if not impossible, to achieve. So these numbers, I think they give us a starting point, a snapshot, a foundation. But I also think it's key for us to look and hopefully we'll be able to have a discussion about what are some of the other key variables with respect to sports coverage dealing with issues of race, gender and sexuality, we have to look at the organizational culture. And I wanted to share a quick anecdotal story that oftentimes my colleague Rich Lapchick tells. Rich Lapchick, he's recognized as an eminent scholar, one of the lead, lead scholar activists in this area of race, and gender, and sport. He's my mentor, colleague, and close personal friend. And oftentimes when he speaks to groups, he'll tell a story. And the story is oftentimes the same. When he travels to speak at an event, he gets in at the airport, let's say speaking to a university athletic department. The athletic department, they'll usually send the highest ranking woman and our person of color to pick him up. So they pick him up at the airport. They say, Dr. Labchick, great to meet you. And they spend the next 15, 20, 30 minutes as right, that individual is giving Rich a ride to the hotel or maybe to a conference talking about how wonderful the university is, how wonderful that sport organization is. Sure enough, after the conference, that same individual drives Rich back to the airport, but now the conversation is different. They're asking him, Rich, can you get me out of here? Why? Because in that day or two, they form a relationship of trust and confidence with Rich, and all of a sudden, they're much more candid. This place is not a great place to work. So organizational culture is key, because if we only look at the numbers, we're ignoring some other factors. Another variable is occupational mobility. My colleague, Dr. Keith Harris, and I, we've been fortunate have the opportunity to work with the NFL in the past few years looking at this issue of occupational mobility, trying to provide some strategies, recommendations to the NFL. What can the NFL do to provide more meaningful opportunities for coaches of color, coordinators of color, general managers of color? And our research has found that there's certain variables. For example, right, variables related to social capital or unconscious bias or something we've termed the reshuffling effect, where you have individuals like Ray Phillips, he's going to be starting his eighth job as offensive coordinator within the NFL. 
So we think occupational mobility is key. How do people get to where they're at? What is the likelihood of them getting promoted? And as Jesse mentioned, I think another key variable is perceived competence. And then cultural competency. And Jesse, you and I were on the exact same page. The situation that took place just a few weeks ago in Chicago, where you had right, two white males who were sports radio hosts, I believe, with CBS radio. And they made completely unnecessary, inappropriate, and sexist comments towards one of their news reporter colleagues. And what I wanted to quickly do is share some of the comments from these radio hosts from the cyberbullying victim and then from an advocate group because I think what that would do is help further set the framework that Christine and Jesse established for the conversation we're hopeful to have with you throughout the rest of our panel discussion today. So this is a quick recap. March 25th, these two radio hosts, okay, one, and I have here a screenshot right, from Twitter. One says, Ayanna Cristal makes me uncomfortable. I feel how hard she's trying and end up awkwardly rooting for her to finish cleanly. And then right, his male radio host colleague responds, I have no interest rooting in her work, right, but then makes a comment about a uh, body part um, on this news report. Totally inappropriate, no need for it. And then they continue with additional Twitter posts back and forth, still focusing on right, these sexist, inappropriate comments. So of course, what happens? These radio hosts, they both issue an apology. I know right, when I have assignments due in class, Students invariably, a few, they'll send me an email the day after class and they'll apologize for not turning their assignment or not doing their highest quality work for the assignment. And oftentimes we'll tell the students, we want to work on avoiding putting ourselves in situations where we need to apologize. So here, ideally, we wouldn't have this situation, but I think the comments provide us with some great content for us to further discuss. One of the radio hosts, his apology letter was titled, On Dealing with Ugliness. And he wrote, I can acknowledge that the culture I work in is often not welcoming to women and is sometimes downright exclusionary, mean, and objectifying. I can try to be a healthy part of the conversation and not part of the problem. I have sexualized perverse human thoughts like just about everyone else. I can be more considerate when they rise to the surface and I can stay out of the sewer when it rises towards me. And here's the apology that the other sports radio host issued on a subsequent radio show. I'm an idiot. My tweet was childish, my tweet was crass and unnecessary, and I'm sorry I dragged an innocent person into it who's doing a job. I made an observation I shouldn't have made. My words are my responsibility, and my words were stupid. And there's nobody else to blame for any difficulties that I might be going through because of my stupidity. It's entirely on me, and I own it. And I wish I would have had a second thought about sending it, and I'm learning my lesson about what is appropriate, what is inappropriate to say, and I feel bad about it. And now here's a response from Ayanna Cristel. This is shortly after these comments were made right, on Twitter. Progress has been made for women in sports, but we still have a long way to go. This incident serves as a gross reminder that women continue to fight every day to be treated equally. My female colleagues share my frustration in knowing the sports industry presents us with challenges of equality in an area that is often filled with misogyny. Sexual harassment is never acceptable and as journalists, we are all responsible for setting a better example when utilizing a platform that reaches the masses. Uh, uh, the masses, excuse me. Profound statement. And last, what I want to share with you is a statement from the Association for Women Journalists of Chicago. The AWJ Chicago urges the SCORE and its parent, CBS Radio, to take meaningful steps to correct the sexist attitudes that are all too pervasive in sports media. We invite Mr. Bernstein to hold a dialogue with us on how toxic uh, this culture is and why it is allowed to thrive and what we can all do to ensure, ensure our work is professional, inclusive, and respectful towards all. So making sure that the sport media industry is professional, inclusive, and respectful towards all. I think there's been some progress, but there's still quite a bit of change that needs to take place. So hopefully right, that will set the framework for our discussion we'll continue to have this next hour. It's interesting that you bring that up because, and just thinking on Jesse's comment as well, I'm just kind of amused because um, one of the things that happened as soon as I came out, I changed my byline from Chris to Christina and immediately got reader comments saying, oh, okay, so you, that was like a nom de net that you adopted because you wanted to be taken more seriously because people would think you were a guy. And it's like, well, okay, that's flattering on one level. It's also deeply troubling because, like, no, women do sports just as well as men. So, 
you know, like, it, it just reflects like an inherent automatic assumed sexism, for lack of a better word, about like, you know, like the quality of content. That said, you know, one of the nice things that grew out of certainly my own transition and reactions from readers was that, you know, like I, this was actually documented in the HBO um, segment that I did with Brian Gumbel along with Bobby Dittmeyer, the trans journalist at LMOB.com, was, you know, like having readers come to one of my book signings for Baseball Prospectus at uh, the Yogi Berra Learning Center. Um, you know, you have a couple of hundred people sitting around listening to a trans person talk about baseball because I don't want to talk about trans stuff necessarily. I'd rather talk about baseball all day. And um, then to have, like, you know, some of the people in the audience get interviewed and ask, you know, like, well, what do you think about that? And they're like, why would I care? I just care about the content, which, you know, like, that's a perfect answer. But then it's taught by an even better one with, you know, a dad saying, like, I want, you know, like, I'm here with my daughter. I want my daughter to think she can do anything and pursue a career in any, anything she wants to go into. And I think that, you know, someone like Christina is an inspiration to her because she's just another representation of the fact that women can do any job that men can do. Um, I mean, I know, I look, I thought it was awesome that you mentioned, like, you know, people like Leslie Visser, because for me, certainly in explaining myself to my mother and, like, you know, looking to, like, what was the unknown, was to point out that, like, look, as a kid, I grew up watching um, Gail Gardner on ESPN and NBC. I wanted to be Gail Gardner when I grew up. And now that I work at ESPN, I'm, like, totally, you know, like, in seventh heaven anyways, but in general, like, you know, early examples, pioneers like Gail, were so important for just proving really what was possible and the inspiration that they provided, as well as the quality of work that she did, you know, just set the stage for so many other people. But the experiences, I mean, that, as you were pointing out, you know, like the experiences that are with us still, you know, that was a problem in baseball and has been a problem in baseball, you know, going back decades. I mean, you look at, like, you know, the re there was a great column that came out a couple of months ago about the experience of Lisa Saxon on the beat as one of the early trailblazers and, you know, gives you a whole new perspective on Reggie Jackson, terrible human being. Um, you know, her experiences, Susan Fornoff's experiences with Dave Kingman that were huge news in 1986, I mean, that was, was a big deal. Um, but the industry had a problem with women, not just on the beat, but women, period, in the workplace. I mean, you know, Sharon Panazzo, when she was working with the Cubs, you know, she wasn't allowed to travel with the team when they were on the road. I mean, and Jim Fry was apparently awful to her. Uh, so, you know, like, to get to the point that we are today, where that kind of stupidity will come out of, particularly, as we can, may have to set aside a special category for, you know, dumb things that get said on sports radio versus, you know, anywhere else. But, um, you know, that, you know, like I know when I came out and when I was put up for a membership in the BBWAA, one of the first things that happened was, you know, like I asked, well, you know, like I'm going to be doing locker room reporting. I'm going to be, doing, you know, like who do I talk to if I have a problem? To have, you know, like one, it was awesome that, you know, the BBWAA, which pretty regularly gets a, you know, a reputation for being older, white, male, conservative, all of which are probably pretty fair accusations, but also, you know, were stand-up guys when, you know, like I, when it came time to vote me in, they voted me in. When it came time for me to say, like, what happens if I run into any trouble, they said, nobody screws, I think it was Jack Connell, said, like, you know, well, you let us know because nobody screws with the BBWA and you're part one of us now. So let us know if you have any problems. That said, baseball, I have had no problems. I mean, you know, I'm kind of sad because the last player that I interviewed before just retired, and who, you know, I could con continue to interview ever after, Paul Canerco, just retired. And Paul was reliably wonderful to talk to about baseball, both on and off the record. And, you know, like, so it's kind of sad to see, you know, that chapter of my own career kind of close, but then, like, just think about, like, my relationships with you know, people who I interviewed as players back in the day, like Chris Singleton, well, now he's one of my teammates at ESPN. And again, my guys have all been reliably cool because for me, it's always been about like reflecting the ethic of I'm here to do the job, I'm not here to be the trans sports reporter or trans, a trans person, period. I'm here just to do sport. I'm here to do the job. 
and the level quality that I do it defines whether or not you consider me a valuable teammate. And then from there, demonstrating that, hopefully creating opportunities for other trans journalists who want to get into sports, want to come to ESPN, you name it. I think the, the hiring decision, from my perspective, I mean, I'm glad you bring up ESPN, and I you know, hate to toot the, you know, uh, my corporate master's horn too much, but you know, like I just look at it as when you know, ESPN approached me in 2010 about like, whether or not I would leave the company that I co-founded, Baseball Prospectus. It was you know, 90 minutes of baseball before I like, then brought up, oh, by the way, you know I'm trans, right? Do you guys have an issue with that? And they're like, no, we don't have an issue with that. We think you're one of the six people in this country who can do this job. And so you know, like, in our search, we wanted to talk to you as well. And it's like, perfect answer. I don't care. You don't care. Let's just like, see whether or not there's a good fit. Christina, you mentioned um, names. I think this is kind of interesting because my name is Jesse Garcia, so my first name is Jessica. Mm -hmm. I have never gone by Jessica, but I have had people who've seen just my byline or seen you know, my name on an email, something like that, haven't met me in person. Then they meet me in person. Oh, I thought you were a guy. Uh, well, you know, first of all, J-E-S-S-I-E is usually the female version, but that's fine. You know, if they, if they get that wrong, that's fine. Uh, you know, I sort of like being able to say, no, this is me, and, it, you know, you read my story or whatever, and yes, I wrote it. I'm a woman. Um, I believe also that there are some authors, I think J.K. Rowling is in this category, um, if I remember correctly, that, you know, she went by J.K., she wrote all the Harry Potter books, of course, um, because she wanted, she didn't want to not be taken seriously as a woman when she first penned these books. So, you know, there are, and I've seen that um, with other authors as well, who maybe just go by their initials or something like that to start off with. So, kind of interesting. Yeah, this is so fascinating because I think we've got so many different layers we can talk about here. We're talking about institutions, both at the level of sport as a business and also journalism as an institution. It sounds like we're talking about peers, working cultures with your fellow journalists, the ways in which um, journalists um, of color who have different sexual orientations or who are women may engage and interact with athletes. And then also the question of covering athletes who have some of these different identities and different ways of identifying. So there's so much that we can talk about and we really want all of you to be involved in this too. So please now feel free to join our conversation and, and ask away. Lots of different questions I know you must have. There, there we are. We have a question from Twitter. Your Twitter. <laughs> I also go by Katie. Um, so uh, this is a question to anyone who wants to answer it, um, uh, which is, would gender bias in sports journalism be reduced if there were more female journalists on air and more bylines, or does it have to go beyond that? In other words, I think to sum it up, is diversity of people enough? Very briefly, I think until we change the culture, Simply changing the numbers is not going to have a sustainable impact. So until people understand how to respect one another, the environment is not going to drastically change. A few of my colleagues and I were working with several youth sport programs to figure out how can we create a more respectful environment, environment of tolerance, inequality, respect, inclusion in youth sports. And one idea that was initially proposed was, well, we'll require all youth sport participants to take a pledge. A pledge, well, I promise to respect you and treat you equally. But then we said, let's back up. Well, if those individuals have no idea how that other person wants to be treated, what it means to treat them with respect, then that's going to be counterintuitive. It's not going to be as effective as we would have hoped. So my quick answer, and I want to hear more from our experts, my colleagues here on the panel, but until we change the culture, which needs some additional change, I don't think we're going to find a solution simply by changing the numbers. I would agree with that, um, but I also think that changing the numbers is helping us. When I first started off, um, you know, being the only female uh, sportscaster for a time here in Wisconsin, um, you know, there were some issues going into locker rooms, and players were not used to women in locker rooms. Um, and now, there are female sportscasters all over the state. Um, you know, probably a third to a half of the stations in our state have a female on their sports staff. Uh, and so women in the locker room are, it, it's a very common thing. And, and that really has, from my eyes, changed, um, started to change the culture in the locker room. Um, you know, some of the things that went on early for me could not happen now without these players or these teams getting in a major amount of trouble. Um, 
and they're just used to women in the locker room as well. So when, when they're there all the time, it's not a big deal. So I think that's encouraging. I also think, you know, like there's a big problem that transcends sports about like, you know, the way in which we gender things and, you know, like activities, you name it. I mean, I grew up, you know, like for me, the concept of women as athletes and women as equals and peers was pretty easy because I grew up on a horse ranch. My dad spent, didn't have anything to do with that. My mom taught me how to ride. I was trained by, you know, a lot of tough women how to break a horse, and what to do, like, you know, like, and how to compete, you know, like in equestrian events and trail riding and you name it. So the idea of, like, women as tough athletes was inculcated right at the outset, you know, essentially, you know, as soon as I could get on back on the back of a horse, you know. So for me, it, it was, you know, like, and even thinking back, the idea of, like, you know, competing with women, against women, having women as teammates, having them as mentors or peers, you know, was just automatic. And that was not just in, like, you know, something like my mom taught me how to, you know, make marinara. My mom taught me, you know, like, how to bust, like, you know, like an 800-pound pony. I mean, that, you know, it's pretty, a different kind of relationship. But, you know, like, even in, like, playing, you know, I remember playing in a, a flag football you know, like all the way back in grade school, we had the first girl on our team in, you know, our grade school flag football team. She had to sue to get onto the team. And she was awesome. She was the quarterback. She, you know, we won. And, you know, to have, like, you know, the opposing team, you know, like go home crying and, like, you know, like I remember one dad consoling his son, you know, from uh, the other school, like sitting there and saying, like, uh, oh, it's okay. They cheated. They had a girl. I mean, it changes this whole concept of like, you know, like in gender inequalities. If people start learning very early on that, that women are teammates and peers and, you know, mentors just as much and have every bit, bit as much to offer, that we don't have to segregate this stuff, that we don't have to, you know, force women to wear pink team garb, that we don't have to, like, you know, all of the stuff that's so weird about our culture, I think, you know, we have to think about how to push back against that and just say, like, no. If she can play, she can play. If she can coach, she can coach. We shouldn't be talking about like he or she. We should just be talking about whether or not they can coach or play. Um, my question's for Jesse. Do you think that you were held to a different standard as a woman in reporting in the field somewhere, whereas if you were expected to know more, or if you made a mistake, people judged you more because you were representative of women as a whole in the sports industry? I do think I was. Um, I think that people looked at you a little more harshly. You know, what, does she really know sports? Um, you know, where if there had been a, a man in my position, that that wouldn't have automatically maybe been the first assumption for some people, you know, that I wouldn't know sports for some reason. So, um, so yes, I do think that there was there was some of that going on, and there was some judgment um, by you know viewers. Uh, I've, I've had a really good relationship with peers over the the time, uh, competitors. At least I think I have. Maybe they were talking behind my back. I don't know. But um, you know, for us, it was all we're just trying to do our jobs, and I think that there was a very mutual respect there, and I really appreciate that. And also from our Wisconsin sports teams, I felt really fortunate. My worst locker room incident did not involve a Wisconsin sports team. It was a team that was in town uh, playing the Milwaukee Brewers. So, um, you know, covering the teams all those years, um, I felt like I, like I did get a lot of respect from them. And there was never a question of, you know, well, what are you doing here or, or anything like that. But from some viewers, yes, they definitely judged a little bit more harshly. And you had to prove yourself. You really had to know your stuff. Um, and I think that's important for young journalists today, uh, too, um, males or females. You know, you don't want to get into this business because you think you're cute, you want to be on TV, you know, something like that. You need to know what you're talking about or you're going to be seen through very quickly. Yeah, I'd actually be curious about your thoughts on, like, you know, to what extent do you feel an obligation to, you know, like in the same way that you would look up to someone like mm -hmm. Leslie, the professor, or me, Gail Gardner, or whatever, that, you know, the obligation is not just to be good at the job, or it's to be great, it's to be the best at the job, because then you're paving a way for everybody else afterwards that, you know, who might be making a hiring decision afterwards to say, like, well, you know, we didn't, we didn't just check the box and hire a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, we checked the box 
but we got a great reporter, we got a great coworker, and we should open our minds to, you know, and I think that that kind of like demand that, you know, I think I have to place on myself, I don't know if you put, but, you know, but we don't have to be just good, we have to be the best so that everybody else who might get hired ends up getting that same opportunity that we've been afforded. Sure, it kind of goes back to the professionalism I was talking about too, I mean, I, I want to be the pinnacle of professionalism, um, and that that will trickle down to young journalists as well. And if they look up to you, they'll look up to you for all the right reasons. Um, so yes, you know, absolutely. Uh, I think there is some of that, and, and we have some responsibility to sort of carry the torch for the next generation and do the best possible job that we can do for young journalists. Um, and I take that role very, very seriously. Um, you know, at our station too, uh, I'm sure at every station, um, and newspaper, you know, I'm not sure about papers, maybe you can talk about that, uh, or online. But, you know, we have to sign a, a morality clause. Um, and so I could be fired for anything that would embarrass the station. Um, and so you think about that quite often. Uh, I'm not going to have a glass of wine and drive home. Um, you know, I'm not going to drink at all and drive home. Um, you know, because I don't want to even come close to that borderline. We also have had, uh, you know, uh, ethical talks in, at our station where, for instance, we cannot take a gift that is higher than $25 in value uh, from anybody. And we'll have people all the time um, from stories say, you know, oh, please take this or do this. Well, you know, you're walking a fine line there. Um, um, my husband's a photojournalist at our station, and he did a story once, and this, this company that made kayaks kept just pushing a kayak, a free kayak on him, you know, for doing this story. And you know, we literally had to just put the brakes on and say, we cannot accept a kayak from you. You know, thank you so much. But this goes over the line of um, journalistic integrity. So we have to be really, really careful about that. If somebody wants to give you a coffee mug and it's you know twenty-five dollars or less, fine. But anything more, even a college sweatshirt that might run fifty dollars, can't take it. Sorry. Jesse, you raised a hugely important point, especially for those of us who are aspiring sport journalists in the crowd. John Skipper, the president of ESPN, last Friday he was visiting with a group of our graduate students at UCF. And he explained to graduate students that he tells all of his employees, especially the 1,000 plus personalities, the folks you'll see on the various shows, whether it's Sports Center, uh, it's his and hers, um, it's first take. He explains, simply put, you have no public, private life. Meaning everything you do is a direct reflection of the ESPN brand and there's going to be zero tolerance for comments whether they're made to Twitter, you post it to Facebook or something else through social and digital media. So it's something to keep in mind because many employers, whether it's on the front end, they're looking at your candidacy for a job or they're evaluating you for a promotion. And starting right now, make sure you're already developing your personal professional brand. I'm sure Christine and Jesse, they could give you some strategies there and what you can do. How can you leverage and utilize social digital media as an effective tool right, to develop your personal professional brand? My question is for Christina. Last year, Grantland took a lot of heat for the story they did on the trans woman who invented the golf putter, but they fell on their sword a few days later. I mean, as unfortunate as that story was, do you think it was healthy for the sports journalism community to have that discussion about how to treat trans issues in yeah, sports? Absolutely. And, and, you know, like, I mean, for me, I mean, my, the response that ran at Grantland as well, you know, like, and, you know, just like thinking back on that weekend um, after the story had run at Grantland and, and just talking about like, wow, that's just not what I would have done. And so, but having that conversation was a reflection on, you know, like kind of, if you have diversity, use it. Because, you know, like, I mean, for me, it was personally frustrating just because, you know, like, although Grantland is in their silo and I'm in dot com and so like you know there isn't a lot of cross conversation you know other than like you find out what they've published and then we decide whether or not we want to place it you know in our individual divisions but but in this situation it would have made a lot of sense to reach across those that divide and have a conversation up front and what was personally frustrating for me was that you know I've done like the Sloan analytics conference and been on panels and seen Bill Simmons and I know Bill and so it was just sort of like Bill why didn't you reach out to me and call me just to talk about this story just because I would have helped you like think about like framing it 
talking about it. I would have been happy to have talked to Caleb, the young journalist who was doing this story, about like, you know, like, you know, there are areas you don't want to go, and there are areas where, you know, like, you know, is it part of the story versus not what part mm -hmm. of the story? And let me help you do that. And let me, you know, like, it's better that you get it wrong with me in that conversation and say where you want to go than to put it on the page and then have to walk it back and explain what you got wrong and how. Was it a good learning exercise for not just the company, or but for sports journalists as a whole? Yeah, I think it was. That said, because I've had these other conversations with people who are not at ESPN, who just call up out of the blue, because I'm not hard to find, and just say, like, you know, like, I'm doing this story, can you help me? And always, I just feel that's just like an, a professional obligation, that, you know, like, I'd rather have you ask me the dumb question than you ask the athlete the dumb question, or you ask the trans person in sports the, the dumb question, and then wind up with a bad interview, and wind up with a bad story, and wind up something that reflects badly on you, reflects badly on trans people, reflects badly on your employer. You know, like, I didn't volunteer to be a public utility, but I'm happy to fulfill that role just because I know that this is some, this is new territory for a lot of people. So. That said, you know, like as a result, I mean, one of the outgrowths of this kind of, you know, this tragic situation with Hesse and Vanderbilt was that it's created an initiative within ESPN, like where in June, we're going to be bringing out a lot of the trans, uh, the leading trans athletes are going to come to ESPN and, you know, like have really kind of do a newsroom, like a very frank conversation off the record, not for TV, whatever, but just a, you know, like here's how they feel their story's been handled, here's how they could be handled better, and, and you know, like, kind of do a direct education of the newsroom and of editors and brass about, like, and writers about, you know, like, really kind of looking both at how stories have been done and how they should be done going forward, and then also kind of, you know, I think it'll be an opportunity to broach the subject of the way in which transport stories are also going to totally change, because in today's environment, um, you have more and more kids coming out at a very early age. I've got a trans kid who's um, in my neighborhood who's a first grader. And, you know, like, which for me was inconceivable to have even thought about like 20 or 30 years ago. But now, you know, this is somebody who is going to be, you know, going through their lives as a trans person, isn't going to really ever think about like, you know, a birth, gender assigned at birth. Um, say, for the sake of argument, that they become, you know, a college athlete and a national, nationally great college athlete. Well, they were, you know, like, they don't have to worry about, they, the whole concept of, like, discussing whether or not they're trans, that's their conversation, but they're not going to be in a position, the same position as someone like Fallon Fox or Kai Allen or Chris Mosier, you know, to talk about, like, well, what was it like transitioning? Well, I transitioned at seven. I don't even what, understand the question. So, like, you know, that kid is going to be in an entirely different situation. And as a story for journalists to cover, that's an entirely different, like, challenge. Is, you know, like, how do you respond to the fact that the kid doesn't want to talk about it? Well, that's where you have to go, is that the kid doesn't want to talk about it. It's not there, it's not yours to divulge, and it's not something that they, some kids are going to want to grow up and be comfortable about talking about their trans identity. Others are not. And so, and that's something where you're going to have to, you know, understand that you have to respect that decision. The, the, the inter, I mean, right now, like, uh, the NCAA has been extremely helpful, like, you know, with trans athletes as they've been coming out. One thing that's, um, you know, like, I was talking with uh, a Division III um, assistant athletic director because it looks like they're going to have, like, you know, a trans soccer player on the men's team here in the Midwest, you know, and so, you know, like, it was interesting to talk to him about, like, well, you know, like, are they out? Do they want to be out? Do they want to, you know, like, do you know what the NCAA is ready to do to help you in case there are any issues? And, you know, like, those kinds of conversations, you know, you can look at it both on a policy standpoint, but also you have in a moral standpoint of, like, you know, how to respect the individual and, you know, also kind of anticipate automatically just from where we all sit as far as, you know, like, What's, how's that going to be covered if it becomes news? And, you know, at what point does it become news? And that, again, really depends on the athlete's willingness to talk about it. Because if they don't want to talk about it, there's no story.
All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question. So let's see. Uh, so hello, thank you all for being here. Um, so we continue to see these stories of athletes that are coming out or are kind of the first people in their sport to be uh, a member of a minority community. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are. This is general journalism, but I'd like to focus on sports. Um, what do we as journalists do to continue highlighting the achievements of minority players and minority athletes in sports without kind of sensationalizing or tokenizing them? Um, so someone like Monet Davis or when Michael Sam came out, how do we avoid making them the, you know, the gay uh, football player or et cetera? I could. Uh, well, my first thought was just that, you know, I think it'll, it'll change as, for instance, when you mentioned Michael Sam. Um, when we see more NFL players come out as gay, then he won't be the token one who everybody has to do a story on, that kind of thing. It takes a lot of courage um, to do that, you know, and, and so I, I saw a quote from him just a couple weeks ago where he said that there are a lot more gay players in the NFL um, than anybody thinks and that they haven't they just haven't stepped forward yet. He's not going to out anybody. Um, but I think that will begin to change the culture when we see more. Um, and, and Monet Davis, as, as, as wonderful as she seems to be and as great a story as she seems to be, she, in my opinion, has gotten just way too much uh, press for a you know, preteen girl. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's healthy for her, period. Um, but, you know, uh, she's the story because of, of who she is, um, and, and everybody wants to do that story. Um, if there are more female pitchers, then she won't be the story. So I'm hoping as time goes on that these people won't have to carry the torch for whatever area it is that they're in. Uh, the one thing I would say is, like, you know, the, the, the demand of being in this business is that you respect the history of, of your individual sport. It is, from my perspective, impossible to talk about Michael Sam without talking about, you know, Dave Copay. It's impossible to talk about, and, and I mean, what's also just, you know, like I think that, you know, it's we look at, we see advertised like the efforts of Billy Bean in, in Major League Baseball's diversity and inclusion initiative. But at the same time, we should also be talking about Glenn Burke and shouldn't forget Glenn Burke and the role that Glenn Burke had. Because Burke, for me, is a particularly, you know, like in the same way that it, like a trans journalist like Nancy Hunt at the Chicago Tribune came out in the 70s and it was both not a big deal but also not handled well because she was um, taken, this was an award-winning, you know, war correspondent and moved to the copy desk because they weren't comfortable with the idea of being a trans journalist. You know, and like doing that role for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, looking at Burke, you know, like it's like you know he came, he was out, but you know, like we didn't have a culture in which we had press conferences to announce, oh, by the way, I'm gay, I mean, because back then we didn't hadn't created that that idea that this is a story and something we should cover or should discuss. And athlete, you know, like didn't necessarily feel like. So what? It's, I, you know, like I'm a gay man. He, the fact that the horrible things that he had to put up with from Tommy Lasorda, from Billy Martin, from people in Dodgers management, you know, that is a story that we should talk about more. And the fact that, you know, like perhaps, you know, has that culture changed so that things are better? Yeah, in the sense that, like, looking at Billy Bean's, like, initiative, uh, the initiative around Billy Bean is pretty cool. Or, you know, like I've met with Major League Baseball to talk about, like, you know, trans inclusion in youth sports, and they immediately get the idea that, oh wow, so you're thinking we could possibly have a trans man pitching in Major League Baseball in 20 years? And it's like, yeah, maybe, and that would be pretty awesome. But let's create, and then that's where I would, you know, both agree, you know, like I, I understand what you're saying about Monet, but at the same day point, you know, like you want her to have a normal childhood and get to be a kid, you know, it's gonna be tough to be that first trans kid who's like pitching in, Little League or Little League World Series, or to be the first trans kid who's going to play in college baseball or maybe maybe the major league. It's going to be both awesome, but it's also going to be really difficult. And that's where, you know, like we get into, I think, the difficulty of, you know, like how much, 
how much extra attention are we supposed to give to this to any particular individual on the basis of identity? When at the end of the day, they just want to play. Did you want to say anything else? Okay, well I think we're out of time here, but thank you all so much. Thanks for being on this panel. It's a real great.